In this video, I talk with my friend Kat Swatel. Kat is a technologist who's interested in philosophy and feminism and different forms of ethics and applying those ideas to practical industry as well as uh, human society as a whole. She's also been a good friend of mine for a little while. And there are some topics that she's been getting interested in and talking about over the last year or so that have been really interesting to me and have connected to some of my own interests, particularly around speciesism and uh, the different environmental issues that we're facing on this planet. And this is a topic that's been uh, difficult for me to think about and talk about publicly because on the one hand, there's a lot of grief emotionally about it for me, but also a fair bit of mental confusion about what the problem is and how to talk about it and how to think about it in ways that people understand and can relate to. And so in this conversation, I ask Kat a lot of questions about the different ideas that she's interested in and where she's coming from. And then we use that as a kind of basis to talk about speciesism and the problems around that and how to frame those and how to act with those problems in mind. And it was a really delightful conversation. Uh, really happy to have had Kat on. It was also at least for me, um, you know, brought up a fair amount of sadness and grief. And so it might be sad for you as well, but I think it's an extremely important conversation and I was really grateful to have the opportunity to talk to Kat about these things and I hope you'll enjoy it. Hi Kat, thanks for joining me today. My pleasure, thank you for having me. So um, this is gonna be a bit of a unusual conversation, as I mentioned to you. I want to like interview you for sort of the first half and then use that as the basis for uh, kind of exploring a, a topic together around speciesism and ethics. And um, I think that there are some pieces of the puzzle that you have that if we put what we have together, we could generate some really interesting stuff. Um, but before I get into that, so can I imagine some people that are watching this will know who you are and some people won't. So can you introduce yourself and just share a little bit about your career and also your interests and um, the kinds of things that you get up to? Yes. Well, I'm Kat Swatel. I work in tech. I like working on things that I call the edge of now. So things that either shouldn't exist anymore or shouldn't exist yet. Those are the kinds of things that I'm interested in. And I'm really interested in um, how the fact that software changes more quickly than soft tissue. So we are entering a digital era and uh, how is that affecting society and us individually and um, our own brains and all of those kinds of things. That's primarily what interests me. Yes, and I feel that now uh, we have a really interesting chance to move beyond primarily paradigms that are oriented towards scarcity. So yeah, that's kind of what I get up to. Cool. Um, yeah, and I think I'll just add that like what I've appreciated about knowing you over the last couple of years is like you strike me as someone, well, one, you've been a really good friend to me and it's been lovely to get to know you. Uh, but above and beyond that, like just in the work that I've seen from you, you seem to be on the one hand, extremely practical. There are a lot of amazing tools that you use to get stuff done, good stuff done. And then you're also very thoughtful. You know, you've read a lot of really interesting things, been exposed to a lot of interesting ideas, digested them for yourself and you know, shared those with people. And then those thoughts typically seem to orient around um, sort of a heart-centered approach, you might say, of like caring for folks, um, you know, um, feminism and things like that. And that that's such a really unique and lovely blend that makes it me really happy to be connected to you and to learn from you. So um, wanted to reflect that a little bit for our audience. Um, Thank you. Can you say a little bit about how philosophy fits into your work? And yeah, like I imagine a lot of technologists would be like, let's just learn this software or this tool or this framework. Let's just build the thing that we're trying to build. And it seems to be a really important part of how you approach your work from what I can tell. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, but I will preface it by saying I'm not a philosopher. Uh, so I have investigated 
philosophy, uh, but through the course of my work. So just like I said before, I think that right now we're in the midst of this big change and we can use that change to help all people flourish, which is really cool and awesome. And there's no reason we can't imagine that. And I've just found that philosophy, there are some areas of philosophy that where that imagining is not like taboo, like it is in other fields, especially in software engineering and other kinds of engineering, right? Like that's all about what can you actually make right now. And um, I guess I like to imagine the best possible right now. And philosophy helps me do that. I also think that, uh, you know, reading about philosophy and ethics has helped me become sensitized to some signals in my environment that I might not otherwise have noticed about when things are going in a direction that I like that is aligned with my purpose and when things are going in a direction that is perhaps not so aligned with my purpose. Uh, so that's been really valuable because I feel like the more I learn, the less I'm in a situation where I'm like, this is not at all aligned with who I am and what I want to be, how the heck did I get here? <laughs> I do still end up in situations, but at least I now have some hints of how I got there. Hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, how, how did you start to get interested in philosophy in the first place? I have no idea. I guess it, um, when I started working on projects, in like emerging technologies because it to me I don't know why I guess because a lot of the people that I encountered in those spaces came from really privileged backgrounds so they would see oh the technology can has this promise and can do this and uh, I came from perhaps not as privileged of a background you know still lots of privilege but not like those folks and uh, so I'm like, sure, it could do that, but it could also do this horrible thing, right? Like, don't we all see that? And you're like, no, didn't see that at all. And then um, I ended up finding some people who were like, yeah, I see the same thing. Have you read this or have you thought about that? And um, yeah, I guess I just tried to like put myself out there in the world talking about those things so that maybe other people who thought the same or saw the same things would come and find me and that's what happened and then I learned more stuff and that led to more stuff and that led to more stuff and I kind of just like you said before had this idea that I got to get stuff done and I didn't really care whether the tools for that were coming from philosophy or ethics or software development or it didn't really matter to me totally totally yeah so let, let's start talking about ethics and, um, you know, just to preface this a little bit for my own background, you know, uh, I was actually talking about this with my friend, Laura Cleveland recently, we went to St. John's together, St. John's College, and we actually mentioned this, that the, the curriculum there goes up until about the 1950s. So Heidegger, Wolf, that's about where it stops. And then a lot has happened in the last 70 years. And then, you know, actually she and I have both spent you know, about five of the last 10 years in monastic training, which uh, is not under a rock, but, you know, I spent a lot of time in retreat and offline and also in rural Vermont. And so um, that's kind of where the question I'm about to ask is coming from is like a place of well-meaning, perhaps ignorance, shall we say. So pretend you're talking to someone from the 1950s or something who's a nice person, but doesn't know anything uh, about current cultural trends and especially ethical trends. And uh, yeah, so with that preface, like, can you tell me about your, you might, I might say like ideological or ethical commitments to things like feminism or anti-racism or anything related to that? Like, just tell me about that. Okay, uh, yes. So uh, I have a fundamental belief that a lot of the 
problems that we experience in society today are because we've gone really far in the direction of having choice as our ethical center. So like choice is the most fundamental best thing like all people have choices and anything that happens to them is a result of their choices and uh, you know who you are is just a culmination of choices and I, I don't see how that could possibly be that just doesn't seem possible to me so I uh, strongly believe that care should be the center of our ethics. And certainly we want to enable people to make good choices and all of those things, but I think care should be our center or at least it is mine, I hope. Um, but that's when we center care, we realize that each one of us uh, is not really an individual making individual choices, but that we exist as part of uh, a collective that is the human race and a collective that is the whole planet, the whole earth, a collective that is all of these different things. And it becomes really difficult when you do try to think through it, like what is me versus not me, right? Like um, even self-defense, right? We talk about a lot about like self-defense. Okay. So that means protecting me, myself, but then we also say self-defense when you're protecting your home or your family or your pets or right. So it becomes really difficult, even on things where like that should be cut and dry. Self-defense should be cut and dry, but it's not actually because we define ourselves in relationship to other beings. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where I fall and I'm, that makes things uh, like feminism and anti-racism really attractive to me, right? Because that's just, I realize that if whatever I put out is hoping that all people and all beings flourish, then that makes my whole self better if that makes any sense, because mm -hmm. I am defined through my relationships with the living world. So that's kind of where I fall on that. And that is how I um, certainly define feminism, but it's impossible for me to be like, oh, you know, some people say feminism means that you think that women should be better than men. Well, then that, that can't actually exist, right? Because if women were better than men, it would make the women less. <laughs> and so you can't possibly do that. You just have to hope for all beings to flourish. Mm. Otherwise your brain will just be tied in knots perpetually. <laughs> mm. Mm. And yeah, you you talked at the beginning about, of that about um, like this contrast between an ethics of choice and an ethics of care. Can you just... Um, maybe define that a little bit. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So choice, like I said, it, it means that uh, we should protect people's ability to make choices and whatever happens to them is the result of their choices. In fact, even keep this quote around. Mm. I have to just rewrite it on sticky notes all the time to get worn out, but uh, it's from Ursula K. Le Guin. It's part of a story uh, just talking about one of the characters. Like most people, he believes you are what happens to you. The rich and strong must have virtue. One to whom evil has been done must be bad and must be rightly punished, right? So if we believe that choice is the most fundamental thing, then we can't possibly believe that circumstance has anything to do with what happens to people, right? Uh, so I think that choice is really dangerous but we have that right like you should be allowed to make your own choices and I should have freedom of choice and uh, but we're not free from consequences <laughs> where that leads to a lot of weird things right like if I know that I'm free to make certain kinds of choices then I will preemptively protect myself from someone else making those same kinds of choices so that leads to a lot of violence in the world right and it's inherently hierarchical and leads to a practice of 
power over other people, right? Uh, so that's kind of choice, but you could see that even in the way that our concepts of moral development have evolved, right? Like we have Kohlberg's moral development, and that's how we assess children. Are they progressing morally? Uh, and those are all things about choices. How would you individually make a moral choice in this situation? And a lot of times the, the scenarios that we use to assess that are even us making moral choices on behalf of someone else, which is like, blah! <laughs> um, so that's kind of choice and care. The progression of care would be, first I have to care for myself, right? Like that's your baby care morality. I have to make sure that I continue to exist as a being and then you graduate from that and go through perhaps a period of self-sacrifice you're like I have to care for all the others around me and I'm unable to balance that with the care for myself and then finally you would realize that caring for your surroundings and caring for yourself are the same thing because you are a part of that whole so kind of resolves a lot of moral dilemmas there right if I can just zoom out a little bit it makes it much easier for me to make a, a moral choice in a dis any decision because I am situating myself as a part of a whole rather than I am an indiv individual and there are all these other individuals uh, but rather just acknowledging that we are bonded and connected, whether we like it or not. <laughs> right. Okay. That's really helpful. Um, can you maybe illustrate that distinction with an example that's like real or imagined, just a, some situation that would illustrate a, dis a distinction between an ethics of choice and an ethics of care? Yeah. Uh, the one that gets a lot of attention and there's like whole books written about it as far as care uh, is healthcare and healthcare systems that are oriented around choice um, will be like, well, you're unhealthy because you made bad choices. Mm -hmm. So it should be more expensive for you personally to be unhealthy because you're unhealthy as a result of bad choices, even though that's wild right mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you made good choices you'd have better health care and you would be able to be healthy um but that's really expensive as a whole right like the who has the most choice oriented health care in the world the united states we also the total cost of providing health care in the united states is higher per person than it is anywhere else in the world, but we're fine with that, right? Because people are paying an amount that is fair based on their choices. Uh -huh. um, and in other systems, what we would be doing is saying like, well, we, we want to have the best system that produces the best outcomes for the whole, both in terms of like the cost of providing the care and also uh, just keeping people healthy, right? Like when you're looking at the whole instead of what is fair, you're like, well, it's actually much better, more efficient for our society in terms of cost, in terms of everything, right? If we keep people healthy rather than treating them when they're sick, right? And that's kind of a good illustration for me. I think one is like, it's fair, you pay based on uh, what is happening to you individually. And the other one is kind of, okay, well, we don't wanna lose this however many days of productivity across our society. So we gotta keep people healthy and we don't want the cost of this system to be astronomical. Uh, so we gotta keep people healthy and kind of that is an orientation towards care. So kind of zooming out and we don't care about what is fair for any one person. We're just realizing that we got to keep this 
going. Yeah, keep this machine moving. Let's go. Uh, so we're kind of invested in that. We're invested in uh, power to accomplish whatever it is we're trying to accomplish as a society rather than power over and fairness. Hmm. So would a consequence of that be like in a healthcare system that was based on ethics of care that like if you needed care, you would get it? Yeah, and you would get the care that you need, right? Uh -huh. So we would have less of like, uh, this is how we react to this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because we're not trying to like grade people's choices. We're just trying to say, okay, our goal here is to have a healthy society. So this person needs this. Cool. Let's roll with it. Gotcha. Oh, that would be a lot better. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I'm just, as you say that, remembering like my own encounters with the healthcare system and people in my family and loved ones, and it's it's just a total mess. So uh, I'm grateful that there's this other perspective on it, and I hope that it uh, manifests in some way because what we have is not working. So. Um, no, from a lot of a lot of angles. Uh, so that's a really good example. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's a great book by Anne Marie Mole. I can't remember. I'll look it up, but uh, all about this, about how care could be expressed through healthcare systems. Amazing, amazing. Uh, so talk to me about epistemic justice and epistemic injustice and uh, what that is and what the different flavors are and um, yeah. Yes, yeah, I'm really interested in this field of study and philosophy called epistemic injustice. Um, and it is basically the idea that, that certain people and groups are wronged in their capacity as knowers. Uh, both of themselves and of their experience and interactions and um, how that's just bad for everyone. <laughs> if, if, right, like if you can't benefit from someone else's experience because there is some sort of injustice being perpetrated, that's also bad for you, even if you're the perpetrator of the injustice. And uh, epistemic injustice comes in two flavors pretty much widely accepted to be two flavors. So one is testimonial injustice. And that's where there's something about me that causes my testimony to be discounted or in, you know disregarded. Um, and there's lots of examples of this, right? Where, you know, I'm a woman in tech. So right away, whatever I say, people will, naturally based on the socialization that we have in tech they will be like well i don't know she better work pretty hard to prove that point and the nasty thing about testimonial injustice is i can do it to myself right like i can believe that um you know because i graduated from a state school that i maybe I don't, I have this feeling, but maybe it's not right. How could I possibly know? Or because I don't have a computer science degree, gosh, do I really know that? Everyone else is saying that it's not true instead of being like, hey, I have this really unique perspective because I don't have that computer science degree. And um, so you can do it to yourself, which is the awful thing about testimonial injustice. Um, and then the second one is hermeneutical injustice. And that's where we lack the narrative resources to understand a group of people's lived experience. So those people are hermeneutically marginalized. Like they don't have the tools to describe their own experience to someone else and someone else wouldn't have the tools to understand that lived experience, even if it was articulated. In the example, there are lots of examples like the consciousness raising groups, you know, from kind of first and second wave feminism where uh, people 
didn't even realize how they were being marginalized in society until they go to these groups and then get this language, right? Like about sexual harassment. That's actually a really recently invented term, right? There used to be no term for that. So people are like, why is there so much more sexual harassment now? Well, <laughs> because we have words for it. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, postpartum depression is another one. Like it, it's not widely talked about. And so uh, people go through that and just think I'm a bad mom. Like there is no story about this, about not feeling that bond with your child. And then they can have that moment of waking up when someone who does have those resources says, hey, yeah, there is a story about this. Here it is. And then they can explain their experience to other people and be understood as well. So that's what, and the popular example of epistemic injustice that's kind of everywhere right now um, is gaslighting. Everyone says gaslighting, right? And that comes from a play that is kind of old now. Um, where there's a husband and a wife and the husband basically is trying to convince his wife that she is crazy and she starts to believe it. Like at first she goes, no, heck no, I didn't do that. Uh, but after he just repeats it over and over, she's like, maybe I don't know, maybe I am crazy. And it takes a third party who comes in and is like, hey, some of the stuff seems weird, right? And she says, oh my gosh, yeah, I used to think that it seems weird. And then I got convinced that it's crazy. So yeah, that's a big example that kind of everyone knows these days. Yeah, I'm curious uh, hearing that, like how, it, how you would relate a caring ethics to uh, epistemic injustice, if at all, like, are those two things related in your mind? And if so, how? I think they are related, right? Because if we truly want to care for ourselves and for other people, we have to be invested in appreciating everyone's lived experience, right? That is the only way that we can truly care for ourselves and other beings. Uh, so I think they're very much linked together. I think there's this weird thing that happens with the ethics of care. So we think about the ethic of choice and that is so strongly aligned with individualism, but it doesn't actually do anything to appreciate the individual, right? It just alienates the individual. If we move towards an ethic of care, that's all about individuals coming together and being more as a collective, right? So you have to appreciate the individuals and care for them. And I think we can only do that if we learn about epistemic injustice and uh, learn to appreciate the lived experience of others and appreciate and value our own lived experience. Mm. Wonderful. Uh, it's really helpful. Thank you. Um, it's really interesting that you bring up individualism and collectivism. And, uh, you know, that's something that I've thought a fair bit about, but I think in a slightly different context. And so I'd be curious to hear you describe how you think about like individualism in our culture and society and, uh, you know, what the problem there is, if any. Yeah, I think individualism is, I understand it's the word that we have, mm -hmm. but I don't necessarily think it's the best word to describe what we're actually practicing. I think we're practicing some kind of disintegration uh, as in I, as a person, have to view myself as not being integrated at all with anything basically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is just demonstrably not true. And so of course it leads to lots of 
pain and sadness, right? If like the fundamental thing that you believe about your world is not true, then it's going to make your life really difficult. Your brain's going to be bending itself in all kinds of knots every single day. And we see that, right? And uh, I think collectivism is really just trying to appreciate what is actually true about our world, that we're not an aggregate of individuals, that it's this integrated system that is our, you know, our all sorts of little subsystems and ultimately our actual living world that we exist in. So it, it makes it individualism is easier for our tiny little human brains perhaps to like grasp as a concept right it makes it but then once you try once that concept encounters the real world it's just constantly being broken which i think causes all of us a lot of pain what are some ways that you see that um happening in the world where like the concept of individualism or separateness or uh self as one of many parts uh where where do, where do you see that sort of uh disjunct between reality and concept happening there's so many mm -hmm. ways right like the climate is mm -hmm. a really interesting one and there's a book called uh strangers in their own land where mm -hmm. like an ethnographic researcher actually goes and looks into this right but um I can, if I view myself as being an individual, right, then I, I make individual choices to like maximize how far ahead I get individually. If I'm just part of an aggregate, then how I, how I flourish is to get more of a pie than the other pieces, the other things that exist in this aggregate, right? That's the only way is it's just to be on top. If I'm not integrated with all of these other pieces, then I can just suck the life out of them, right? And that is what we see happening in the environment, right? And with climate change that, okay, well, I am not part of this. No, and so what would serve me is to just extract as much as I can from this. And we see how that breaks people's brains when they encounter the outcomes of that, right? Like, okay, well, I'm going to be, I need to just extract as much as possible because I'm not part of this. I'm gonna lie myself, extract as much as possible, vote for politicians that believe in rolling back environmental protections and all because that's how I make money that's how I exert power over my surroundings that I am not part of uh, and then we see things like there are immediate consequences for that right like respiratory illnesses going way up and cancer going way up and um, we immediately see the outcomes of that that disprove no you are not separate from those things it will not work for you to just extract as much as possible that's not how any of this works <laughs> <laughs> definitely definitely yeah i'm really on board with that it's, it's just helpful to hear how how you see it because uh, i think yeah again i'm sort of coming at it from a just a different set of experiences and perspectives. And so it's nice to hear. I, I'm frankly sort of surprised to hear every time I hear you or I know I've seen Simon Wardley talking about this, like talking about problems with individualism. And um, it's it's a pleasant surprise, I say, because uh, <laughs> I, I, I guess I didn't expect it to be in the broader dialogue. So um, I'm working hard to make it part of the broader dialogue. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So yeah, if, if you want it to be part of the broader dialogue, I could easily imagine, and even there are parts of me that are like having this active a little bit, but certainly in the broader society, um, like people that are like, oh, well, this Kat Swatel person, she seems to be, you know, she's 
what she's talking about is like collectivism and communism and socialism and feminism and anti-racism. And actually those things seem really bad. Uh, they're threatening to me. What would you say to a person that, you know, has, feels intellectually or emotionally threatened by these ideas? I guess first I would just try to get curious with them. Like mm -hmm. what about that is threatening? Like mm -hmm. how do you see that playing out and why is that threatening for you? And, uh, you know, just ask questions in that way. I don't like, I don't, it sounds probably terrible. I don't know. Okay, so my partner, he strongly believes that like the way that you make change is through individual interaction. So mm -hmm. he is the person that's like, this person has, I see them having so much sway in their peer group and I, I see them doing harm to themselves and others. And uh, it's making me super sad right now. Like, I'm just going to engage with this person over a series of interactions in a non-threatening way. And uh, that works so well for him because he's charismatic, and charming, and people want to engage in a one-on-one -on -one interaction with him. That is not me. <laughs> uh, you seem pretty charismatic to me. <laughs> On the opposite end of the spectrum, I'm like, sure, give me a microphone and a stage. Like, that's how I feel like I can contribute by, because that is how I think about things by zooming way out and being like, hey, let me paint you a picture of this big time span of this big scope. And then you can, you personally can do the work of like zooming in and out. And I'm just trying to paint you a compelling picture that is perhaps bigger than the one that you consider each day, both in terms of time and in terms of the, I guess, physical scope. So that's what I try to do and just help people encounter different perspectives, right? Like, I don't think a lot of people think about that. Like, okay, if feminism wants women to be privileged over men and other people uh how how does that work like realistically how does that work if they become more privileged then won't that end up making them less happy <laughs> right like there are lots of things that uh, men in our society are deprived of, right? Because we tell them that that's not something you do, that's feminine. Well, and then if we just privilege women, then are they going to lose access to the other things, right? Like, uh, you know, there are lots of things that I enjoy uh, because I'm a woman, I have greater social access to some of these things, right? Like I can dress however I want. I could wear a dress, I could wear jeans and a t-shirt, I could, but uh, you know, whether we like it or not, if my partner showed up to work in a dress, people would be like, oh, how are you feeling there, buddy, right? Like that's not something that is socially available to mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. And so I guess, if you play that out over a long enough time horizon, you're like, great. So we, yes, women are just exerting power over everyone else. Uh oh. So that means all, all the more masculine things I now lost access to. Like, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good without all that. And I think if you just play out some of these things that people are afraid of over a long enough time horizon, they're like, oh, you know what? On second thought, that makes zero sense. <laughs> and that's kind of just how I come at it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, and I heard you say earlier too that like, um, oh, something, something like uh, there, there was a sense that if there were a shift in these directions, like things would be better for everyone. And it's not about uh, just like inverting things so that they're, uh, 
better in a different way no. for some people, but it's actually that you want it to be good for everyone. Um, yes. Yeah. That's my definition of feminism. Mm -hmm. I want flourishing for everyone, mm -hmm. all beings, because it just becomes difficult to like draw a line at a certain point, you know, mm -hmm. I am lazy and don't want to go through that exercise of drawing the line. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Right. Totally. Uh, yeah. And you also said, when I asked you about individualism versus collectivism, you said that like, for you, it's more helpful to frame it in terms of like separation and disintegration rather than like individual and collective. And I know, um, you know, it's almost sounds like there's something similar happening there with feminism where like there could be a, a appearance problem or like a marketing problem where it seems like, oh, it's just about yeah. making women better, but it's actually about all people, all beings and, um, I think, you know, I've heard similar people talk about similar things with like racism where it can boil into like, oh, you're a racist or you're not a racist. And it's sort of a name calling exercise, whereas it's more of a systemic problem that's not good for everyone. Um, and do you see a pattern there? And if so, like how, how can we name these things so that it's useful rather than like confusing or distracting or problematic? Yeah, I mean, the names that we have for things come from the paradigm that we're in right now, which is strongly oriented around choice, right? And so there is part of, part of it is like, well, is it better to make a little bit of incremental change right now? So I need to use words that are meaningful right now, um, or is it like, do we want to use words that are perhaps even more radical according to the current paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. Like disintegrated is, doesn't conjure up like nice, anything is possible images <laughs> in your head, right? And so yeah. Like, yeah, like for me, it does describe what is happening right now, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably a word with a marketing problem too, right? Mm -hmm. And <laughs> like, but it, I think it is just because we are so oriented around choice that everything is like, well, you have to choose between these options. Do you want patriarchy or do you want feminism? Like, right. well, if feminism means matriarchy, then I don't think I want either one, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? And so we have an issue if we're going to be oriented around choice, then that necessitates that we have the choices clearly painted out, right? And you can be like, well, I, I like that one. That will suit me just fine. Uh, so there's got to be some kind of circle where we like, okay, let's think radically. These things are possible. Uh, and there's a plurality of things that are possible. And it's not that we get to like choose one of them because we can't possibly know all of the effects of the things that we choose. We can't possibly know what everything that is possible for us to choose from. So yeah, I mean, there's obviously a problem with the words. Uh, so I think it's probably just better to be focused on like, let's have this discussion and then choose the words that are meaningful within that discussion, which is of course a very laborious process, but it is what it is. Like mm -hmm. I'm I'm ready to do the work. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So we'll see. Yeah. It makes me curious to ask like within the context of this conversation and everything that we've already laid out, like uh individualism, collectivism, feminism, anti-racism, ethics of care, uh, epistemic injustice, like, are there any words that you would want to rebrand with the context, the shared context that we've already established here, or like, uh, you know, moving, say, from individualism to dis, like, you know, disintegrated or something like that? Like, are there any other words that you would want to shift or drop into the conversation? Good question. Um... 
I don't know. I guess the only other, like, this isn't really an answer to the question you just asked me, but it mm -hmm. is something that gets under my skin a mm -hmm. little bit. I really dislike it when people want to talk about epistemic injustice and instead they say, well, I want to talk about epistemic justice. Mm -hmm. And for me, that is part of the problem, right? Like that you right away want to move to epistemic justice instead of appreciating the injustice that has occurred, right? Like we have to have a period of appreciation for that. Uh, and there's this scholar, Judith, Judith Schlar, and she says uh, something like, you miss an awful lot by looking only at justice. Uh, so that, I guess, if I'm going to ask people to use different words, I guess I would ask people in the industry. That's typically who I hear doing that. They right away want to go for epistemic justice and mm -hmm. disregard epistemic injustice, which is really where the exciting information, right? The new information is in the injustice. That's where we have new things to discover. And I feel like people shouldn't be, I don't know, it's like they're kind of made uncomfortable or kind of ah, that's icky. Like, I don't want there to be injustice, but the fact that there is injustice means that there's a bunch of new information there that through the process of appreciating that and like getting curious about the injustice, that means that we can tap that new information, like gain really powerful insight about our history and our current situation. Mm. Oh, that's really helpful. Thank you. Uh... Yeah, so I feel like we've got a lot of things on the table that we've sort of laid out. And, you know, we've got um, caring ethics, feminism, anti racism, epistemic injustice, individualism, collectivism, or shall we say, disintegrated society or something like that. Uh, and for me, there's, yeah, again, sort of a puzzle piece or several puzzle pieces I'm wanting to add. And it's, there's, there's something there for me that I've been um, interested in intellectually and grieving emotionally for some time that I haven't really been able to articulate to myself in a way that's sufficiently clear. And yet to me, it's, it's clear that it's urgent. Uh, and so that's part of why I wanted to have the conversation because um, even I, I have the sense that you could help me make this clear in some way through the lens of the things that we're talking about. And uh, so I think it would probably be helpful to have that conversation if I sort of just shift gears a bit and, and add what I've got to the table uh, with the qualification that even in my own experience and mind, it's a bit confused. And then, yeah, also that there's a lot of um, grief there. It brings up a lot of grief for me. Um, does that sound okay to shift gears yep. that way? Mm -hmm. okay, great. So, yeah, and I really, um, as we go in this direction, like, let's have a conversation about it. And if there's something you want to ask or say, or uh, something that you're curious about or interested in, like, let's steer there because this is okay. um, confusing to me and hopefully we'll figure it out together. Uh, okay. So I'm trying, I was trying to even reflect before this conversation what the pieces are for me. And there's a few different ones. And again, some of it isn't completely clear to me. It's, it's some of it's intellectual and some of it's really felt and like almost like consciousness shifts. Um, but I'll try my best. So one is uh, um, coming from the context of Buddhism and in particular Mahayana Buddhism, where there's a a, a dedication to serving all beings, all beings. And so that's all beings now, uh, in the future, in the past, here, there, human and non-human. Uh, this planet, other planets, this universe, other universes, uh, wherever there are beings, it is a dedication to serving all beings. Um, so that's one thing. And then uh, another is, uh, 
yeah, I'm really glad that you mentioned this as well, global warming, environmental degradation, as well as, um, I don't know how well this is known, but, and it's something that I've had to research myself, but there's basically an extinction crisis where humanity has been causing other species to go extinct, basically since there have been homo sapiens uh, and the rate is increasing and it's uh, tragic. Uh, So and that's that's not widely discussed, and um, also similarly, even within the context of discussing global warming and climate change, usually the discussions that I see are about the effects on humans, and not on say animals or plants or the planet. And then, uh, yeah, I think the third piece is um, more on this level of consciousness of starting to become aware of others. So uh, you know, recently I've gotten really interested in theory of mind uh, and I'm, I'm sort of acutely painfully aware of some of the limitations of my own theory of mind that it's really hard to model other people and know where they're coming from and that that causes me and them problems when I'm not able to see that they have an experience. And um, but in some ways um, I'm able through, I think through meditation to get like a, a felt sense of what it's like to be someone else. And um, really over the last year or so, there's been a shift where, you know, I spent a long time in solitary retreat last year in a cabin in the woods in rural Vermont. And when I first started being in the woods, um, it was like, I would look at trees and animals or hear birds and it was like they were colors to me or like shapes. But then over the time, as my mind got simpler from just meditating a lot uh, and being in a natural setting, um, it was like those trees and animals and plants were, were friends and beings rather than objects or material or colors or shapes. Uh, and that was both really beautiful because it's like, wow, I have, thousands upon thousands of friends that I didn't know that I had. And yet uh, it was also tragic because I realized I'd been uh, missing, not seeing, not perceiving, and therefore misbehaving towards uh, all of my friends and all beings. And that became very felt. And um, yeah, and so from that angle, you know, really seeing that all over the place in human society of the ways that we um, overly focus on people and humans and miss plants and animals and the planet and even, um, you know, other forms of beings uh, and other beings, maybe there are beings on other planets, like there's a, there's a grief there at, at noticing all of the myriad ways that uh, we don't see and then therefore misbehave towards these uh, beings who are alive. And um, I think for me, all of that is sort of wrapped up in the best word that I have for it is speciesism, uh, where we overly privilege humans and therefore abuse and act unjustly towards others on this planet and in the universe. And th again, that's, that's sort of intellectual understanding, but when I do encounter it in a direct way, it's just so much grief. And uh, I think that the pieces that you, you know, we, we laid out together earlier can help uh, maybe describe that a bit more accurately and then also help make those shifts more available that so we can start to uh, treat the planet and other beings with more care and compassion rather than um, you know, abusing them essentially. Um, so that was a lot, a few other pieces. Do you have any thoughts hearing that or uh, anything that comes to mind or your heart hearing all that? I don't think I'm gonna have any answers mm -hmm. for you because I find myself having a lot of the same feelings, right? Like, because it's hard for me to draw a line like, oh, this is where myself ends and this is where other begins uh then yeah a lot of things 
bum me out, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know where you, like, where do you draw the line? Like extracting this from the environment is okay. And extracting that is not okay. Like it seems just impossible to draw those lines. So I struggle with the same thing like the the lines just don't appear for me like they seem to for a lot of other people that I encounter and so I don't don't really know what to do about that Mm -hmm. yeah I, I have absolutely no idea what to do with the problem but it seems like there's like a meta problem where people don't even see that there is a problem because of yeah um yeah I mean it seems like I, if I had to guess if I'm understanding correctly, basically a, a form of hermeneutic injustice where we don't see that uh, plants and animals are beings that are alive or that the earth is could be treated as a being that's alive or that there's um, an ecosystem. I mean, um, uh, the, there are ways of seeing there that would cause us to respond totally different, but we're basically blind to them. So we, within like limited and I would say inaccurate ways of seeing, we're already confined to behaving in inappropriate ways towards these systems. And uh, yeah, does it seem fair to you to say that that's a form of hermeneutic injustice? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And I think there's even something there of like, I think it is both that we can't relate to those experiences and we can't relate to our own mm-hmm. experience because there's not really a vocabulary that I know, at least. It's like a, a, a widely accepted, sophisticated vocabulary around that to describe those things, right? Mm-hmm. Or like, for me, it does feel a lot like... Uh, the discussions around racism like of course I am racist because I'm a white person existing in a a racist system like Mm -hmm. I can't not be racist I have to just try as hard as I can in my interactions and how I present to be anti-racist because it's like just purely by existing in this system I perpetuate racism and it feels uh the same thing, like by existing in, in obviously racism and uh, a paradigm of extraction are extremely like linked. The legacy of racism is totally extraction. Um, but yeah, I guess if I'm existing in a system that is inherently extractive and like you said, has been since the very beginning, then it's impossible, even if my heart is like, oh no, be generative. It is impossible for me to exist in that system and always be acting authentically generative. You know, like I will always be perpetrating harm against my surroundings and myself. Hmm. Yeah, that. Uh, yeah, more more grief. <laughs> um, it it reminds me that in from what I can tell in the feminist and anti-racist movement, you know, again a lot of word emphasis is placed on words and language, and um, I think one of the moves that, at the very least, we can do that seems helpful is uh, frame things in terms of something like all all beings, because um, you know. Well, there's there's pros and cons because that might uh, sort of import Buddhism in a way that make people uncomfortable. I don't know, or or some religious or spiritual context, which you know I'm okay with that, but others might not be okay with that. But on the other hand, if we say all people, I mean, I know in in like native traditions, typically that would mean oh yes, the rocks are people and the rivers are people and the plants are people and animals are people. But in our I mean, frankly, insane society, uh, we don't see these beings as people. That's why I use the word beings, Mm -hmm. because again, it becomes so difficult for me to draw the line, 
Like mm-hmm. I, I need this ecosystem in order for me to survive like this body right mm-hmm. now. So where do I draw the line on what sorts of life I want to flourish mm-hmm. and which ones I don't like mm-hmm. that would be ludicrous for me to think that I, in my tiny little brain can magically know which forms of life are, you know, participating in this system in a way that's keeping the whole thing going. Like Mm -hmm. I, I could spend my whole life thinking about that and 110% not come up with the answers. Uh, So I just don't want to think about it. So just say being. Mm -hmm. I'm all for it. I'm all about (laughs) it. I love it. Uh, Yeah. It reminds me as well that one other encouraging thing that I've seen is there does seem to be a trend in some legal systems to start to treat, say, like certain ecosystems as beings that have legal rights, like rivers or um, forests or things like that. And uh, that seems like a really good move as well to, um, I mean, if we're going to give corporations legal rights, then we should give ecosystems, legal rights, and actually real, you know, that might sound crazy to some people, but like real positive environmental benefits come when people can bring forward a a lawsuit on behalf of an ecosystem of some kind and uh, really want to, I guess, signal boost that as like one, another thing that comes when you kind of shift into this paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. Or even just removing externalities as a thing that we recognize right like there's a growing movement to be like no you externalities are not a thing we don't want to see them on your financial documents like you can't bring that up in court if you didn't anticipate this and like you didn't go out into these communities and you know try to understand the system then that's on you Mm -hmm. and you're liable for it no more externalities Mm -hmm. you know and it is such a big lie right because you look at these companies and in one country they will recognize externalities and then in another country where externalities are not legally recognized then magically there's all of this community work to be done to understand the system and oh okay well now we're willing to change all of these things right Mm. like it's Mm. just the complete externalities are complete fiction and i'm totally here for this movement of just people being like no more you can't just claim externalities that's not a thing Mm. Mm. yeah that's reminding me that like i feel like the other piece of it is uh the caring ethics that like um you know, we talked earlier about the healthcare system and how if you frame it in terms of choice, then all of these injustices are perpetuated. But if you frame it in terms of, oh, I have a medical issue. Okay, what care do we need to give you? Then that's a much more compassionate framing and also, you know, fiscally effective even and uh, beneficial to all. And I think that there's a similar thing happening where and it sort of ties into the, the epistemic injustice because there's an epistemic injustice where we don't notice that there's a problem, so we can't care about it uh, because we're perceptually handicapped or blind to it. Um, but yeah, if we if we are able to make the shift to notice that there is a problem, then we can begin to care about it. And the way that we would respond to that is totally different. I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, just to give a really banal example, uh, my parents have some house plants, and uh, when I recently moved in with them for a little bit, and when I got here, they had this house plant that was like right next. It was like on the kitchen counter. It was like squeezed next to a wall, and I just looked at it and I was like, I don't think that that plant wants to be like squeezed into a wall like this. And I was like, let's move it like three inches to the left. I think it's going to be a lot happier that way. And uh, well, one, they thought it was crazy. (laughs) But two, like if you imagine, say, putting a dog in a corner in a wall, like just thinking about that brings up grief for me. Like if you just put a dog or a cat like in a box right up next to a wall, like squeezed like this for hours on end, like that would be abuse. We would see that as abuse and hurtful, but we are not seeing 
you know, plants or our ecosystems in that way. So in any case, I think it's pretty natural if the, the epistemic shift is made either intellectually or on this like somatic consciousness felt level way, either way, an ethics of care naturally arises, ca compassion naturally arises where you realize we've been hurting all of these beings for so long and that's not gonna work. So um, I think the care is actually already there. It's just the perceptual block to seeing it is, is both, uh, yeah, all, both on an individual level where most individuals don't see it, but also collectively where the systems are perpetuating only a human perspective and not an environmental perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Have you read much uh, Judith Butler? No, no, I've heard of her, but I haven't read her. Yeah. Uh, so she has this whole thing, these questions about grief and uh, her question as it relates to violence, she's asking like, what is grievable? Who is grievable? And we kind of like ourself is grievable. And so that's whether th those are things about my identity. So people who are like me are grievable or that's part of like the groups that I uh, self part of. Uh, like my family. And, and so she points there are some uh, non-human beings that we consider to be like part of our be grievable. And then there are other ones that we just disregard mm. for some mm. unknown reason. <laughs> like yeah. when she kind of like, where is the logic in that? Why are some forms of life grievable? Why are some humans grievable? Why, like, where do you draw the line of grief? Not that you need to, like, be personally experiencing, like, uh, you know, the kind of performance of grief, uh, but more, like, uh, which types of life are potentially grievable. So not saying that you have to personally experience grief for every death or every act of violence, but just does this form of life, these kinds of beings uh, have the potential to be grieved. And for me, that's really interesting question. And I think it helps me explain to other people why I have such a hard time drawing lines, right? Like, my son asked me the other day, uh, why do different people, like different, different animals? <laughs> and then he asked me, why do, why is it okay to eat some animals that you've given a name and it's not okay to eat other animals that you've given a name? <laughs> like, Oh, son, I know you're only eight, so we're about to have a really intense discussion right now. <laughs> uh, what did you tell him? Yeah, I just kind of pointed that out. Like, there isn't any real reason. It's just that we assign some lives as being grievable and some as not being grievable. And, you mm -hmm. know, even the animals that we assign a, a name to and then even actually consume my all grew up on farms and so I think that's very kind of well like you could have a pig that you name and are friends with and then ultimately also consume um and so I kind of just said use that as the explanation like for some people these sorts of lives are grievable even even the flesh that they ultimately consume like they will grieve that right like in some and so really it's for uh we just consider sort of randomly across cultures like certain forms of life as being grievable and certain forms are not and we did have a discussion about like what is known to you is that I'm a terrible mom and I let my eight-year-old watch John Oliver <laughs> <laughs> he watched the episode of 
about the fish consuming microplastics. He was like, well, that okay, because that's bad for fish and also bad for people. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not okay. It's just that we don't talk about it. Like there mm-hmm. is, it's not part of the dialogue. We like don't have a language to describe that. It's not like ready right there for us to describe, oh, our waste byproducts, like all of this plastic, it breaks down in this way. And it's, uh, so there isn't any rhyme or reason to it. And oddly enough, he seemed sort of satisfied by that, like <laughs> knowing that there wasn't a reason that he's missing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it makes me think that like probably one of the most effective and even like radical things that we can do about these issues is just simply to talk about them and refuse to be silent. Uh, and like release it with the emotional pain and also the mental confusion that comes with not having the words for them and just see what happens when we refuse to ignore it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Or try to come up with, for me, what's tempting is to try to come up with some sort of lines or rules that at the time make sense for me, but I have just decided that I'm going to pretty much immediately encounter a situation that's going to break them. Mm. So why bother? Like, Mm. it's better just to be like where I'm at and realize that it doesn't make any sense. And that just is. Mm. Mm. I'm curious to ask just to um, like, how would you, you know, given all of the places that we've been in this conversation and yeah, this turn towards looking at what we might call speciesism, how would you summarize in your own words what we've talked about? Like, how do you currently understand or make sense of these topics given everything that's been on the table in this conversation? For me, what I understand is I exist in a system that is and uh, it's not enough for me to just say, I don't agree with that. I have to be actively pursuing something that is generative and uh, I will, I will never be generative enough to kind of undo the fact that I exist in this extractive system, but at a certain point, I'm hopeful that it will tip into something different. And if I can orient myself towards that and be open to the small signals of how that could become more possible each day, like that is the best way that I can live and so I just need to always have that out front you know I don't know how about you yeah I feel um more grief but also less mentally confused Uh, (laughs) so that's I think that's actually a good sign because there's a there's a lot of grieving to do like when we encounter yeah. these problems, there's, um, uh, a lot of, uh, you might say emotional technical debt accumulated of how long we as a species have been ignoring this problem. And so when we actually begin to encounter it, there is, uh, a lot of grieving to do. Yes. I don't want you to feel like you're alone in that grief, because that can be so alienating. And so uh, I love you so much and I'm sharing in your grief and I mm. see it and yeah. Yeah, I feel I feel less alone too as well. So thank you for pointing that out. I don't know. And, and really, as soon as um, I heard you start talking about these things and got to hear you present on it, um, there's a really fantastic talk that you gave last summer that I'll link to in the show notes. I was like, oh, 
I'm less alone. Uh, so um, especially it's, it's encouraging and hopeful to see it, um, you know, um, that there are pieces of this puzzle in other contexts than the ones that I've been in, because, you know, there's a lot of awareness to this sort of thing in say the monastery that I trained at, but uh, I want that to be uh, an open issue because mm -hmm. part of the problem is just that we don't see it and we're, we're mm -hmm. intentionally or unintentionally ignoring it. So it's, it's really heartwarming to see that you are addressing these kinds of issues and that the, the broader society is also looking at these things and uh, yeah, it does make me feel less alone. So thank you for that. Good. Yeah. Good. Cool. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to me today, Kat, and uh, really, really grateful to have you on and so uh, appreciative of this conversation. Thanks, Tosh, and I loved it. It was <laughs> wonderful. <laughs>